Morning. Actually, it's evening. And the reason these things are being done late in the day at the moment is because I just can't get out of bed on Sunday morning. Um, so rather than do them earlier, I decided to do them later. But you didn't need to know that. This week, I thought it was time for an update on the disk library. Now, I think it was probably around Christmas uh, 2018, so just after Christmas 2018, where I made an announcement on here saying, I have solved the problem and I can now digitize disks for various pieces of equipment uh, and I'm going to create this sound library, which has always been an ambition for quite a while. I honestly thought at that point in time I had solved the problem. However, there were a number of things that sort of decided they were going to jump out and bite me in the bottom. There were four key issues. Number one, I didn't know whether my original source media was damaged. Okay, so that was my first issue. My second issue was I wasn't sure whether the um, machine I was using to create the image, and I'll come on to the image in a while, was creating a good image or not. The third thing I didn't know is if I had a good image, whether I was writing a good image back to the new media. And the fourth one, which I hadn't really thought about and was causing me all kinds of problems without me realizing it, was that I actually bought a load of Duff Media. So I'm so used to, in the past, just buying discs and they work, not expecting to buy discs and find that they didn't work because they were all Duff. So they'd obviously been put in storage for a while. Um, and not stored correctly, hence the reason why they were failing. But the problem was I couldn't see what in my chain of digitalization was actually causing the failure. Now, as I've said before, the reason why I was doing this is because of these things. Okay. Now, if you look in there, what you can see is you can see like a shiny, dull, or uh, dark surface. Okay. Effectively, what these things are, if you've ever looked inside them, is effectively it's a, it's a disc, and on that disc, which is a plastic, is made of a plastic material, is a magnetic media, and they, these things are coated top and bottom, so on both sides, hence the reason why you can access it both sides, with magnetic media. Um, these are actually rated at two mega, two megabytes, two mega, yeah, two megabytes. Uh, in terms of capacity, however, typically when you were talking about running them on a, a Microsoft Windows machine, you could only ever store 1.44 megabytes of data on one of these things, and that was to do with the the FAT um, operating system or the FAT format that these things used. And FAT stands for File Allocation Table. Okay, that's all it means. But it's a specific way of formatting a disk so that uh, an MS DOS or a Windows machine, or an early Windows machine, and in fact, a later Windows machine as well, could read it. Okay, so that's typically what these things had on it. They had a fat partition, or what we call a fat partition. Um, now, these things don't use fat. In fact, most musical instruments use proprietary standards. So, of course, you can't put this disc, when it's written for one of these, in a standard computer and read it because it will go don't know how to read that haven't got the right drivers da 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 go away okay so i couldn't test whether the media was good or not um and i eventually did work out how to test the media but that was a, that's a long story and i'm not going to go into it but suffice to say point four i had a bunch of duff media which was sending me off on the wrong trail um now going back to these things, one of the things, the reasons why I'm creating the software library in the first place is that magnetic coating that sits on this plastic disc, after a while, if it's not been stored correctly, starts to disintegrate. And basically what happens is it lifts away from the plastic surface uh, 
and then as it spins it falls off okay so if these things have not been stored correctly they've been left in sunlight they've been left in the cold whatever it happens to be then the media the magnetic media will start to disintegrate from the disc that renders this useless okay once that happens it is this this thing does not work anymore so the reason I started this is because these things are 30 odd years old okay and because they're 30 odd years old you know the likelihood is that magnetic media if it, if we carry on if I carry on using the original disc that magnetic media is probably going to get start to start to start to go or start to disintegrate at some point you know they only have a working shelf life of so many years and I don't think they were ever thought about being used 30 years down the line so the whole idea is to get the data off this and onto one of those and use a newer disk and put this in storage so in order to do that what we do or what I've done is I've created an image okay so what is an image what's the difference between an image and just writing the files off the disk so typically nowadays if you are um, working with a disk uh, and you get an online disk the manufacturer will send you an ISO ISO okay and that is a formatted image of their disk that you can then mount on your computer and effectively it runs as if it was a separate hard drive or a CD uh, ROM okay that's what an ISO does I have effectively taken the floppy disk drive version of that and created a floppy disk image okay which is what is now sitting on these Duh, 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 duh. there you go there is an image of one of these okay so there was some tweaking that had to be done to ensure that when I wrote that image I was writing a good image so the first thing I needed to understand was was this still good easiest way to test whether this was still good put it in here load it up so that's what I did with every single disk I imaged um, on the T1 and on the S750 and on the S50 and on the TWC, TX16W I loaded it into the machine first to make sure the media was still good it was readable because once I understood that this was still readable and there was a, a couple of issues with this stuff but once I understood the media was readable then I knew I could take an image of it so there was some tweaking to be done on on the way the image was captured but effectively I was able then to take an image and then we had some trial and error and as I said the aforementioned bad media didn't help because I thought I was writing duff images out it turns out the disks were duff not the images um, once I got through that then I was able to the few parameters had to be changed and I was able then to cut an image back to this so that image that sits on this disk is an exact I mean exact byte for byte duplication of the original disk that this came off of okay exact duplication um, so then to round that off to make sure I was getting a good image coming back the other way easiest way to test it again put it into this thing and load it up so I have managed I've gone through the whole of the T stuff I've got and I've effectively loaded that up on here made sure it all works and that's good now uh, what I've also done is for my friend Bruce who was kind of sort of working with me on this journey I've taken an exact copy of all the T1 material and uh, shortly that will be going off to him uh, so that he can play around with all these new sounds as well. So that's sort of kind of the, uh, the sound library, the whole concept behind the sound library. 
um, and how the sound library is being created and how I have tested it. So I know now know that when I create a image from the sound library, I am able to, I know that disc is going to work unless I've got bad media. The flip side of um, that process is also that when these discs in here, with this is my studio copy, when these discs in here effectively get damaged, I can now recreate a brand new exact duplicate of the original and put that back in the studio. So there's been a number of things that had to be done. You know, I've had to write out some labels, you know, to put on each one of the discs. So that's taken time. Would you believe how difficult it is to actually buy disc labels nowadays? You know, back in the day, you used to be able to pick them up in, in any stationery store. You can't buy them in stationery stores anymore. You have to order them online um, direct from Avery, which is where these came from. Um, but it's just interesting where the where where we're going with all this stuff is that you know people aren't making um, or the number of people making this sort of stuff has now diminished, but we still have instruments like this um, that still use these things as their primary storage medium. Now I've said in the past people have said to me about the storage library why are you doing it why don't you just get a sysx file dump it down from a computer, dump it back to a computer. Well, you know what? SysX files are great. And I don't, I'm not being sarcastic when I say that. They are great. But in order to use a SysX file, what you have to have is you have to have the computer, you have to have the MIDI interface set up, you have to have the uh, MIDI cables all plugged in. Whereas with a disk or with a card, should I be more precise? Because there are cards in shot over here. Um, you just put the card in, hit load, job done. Very, very quick. SysX takes time, and I just find it a faff. So that's the reason why I've started the sound library, is because I obviously want to collect the disc. I'm a collector. That's one of the things I do. And I also then wanted to preserve what I have so these will shortly be going off to storage and they will be stored in the in a location so I did a video a couple of weeks ago where I talked about you know if you're going to put your stuff in storage make sure it goes in somewhere that's that's dry not damp um, it's not going to get water logged you know ho but hopefully it's it's maintained at a sort of semi -con constant temperature um, and I've got some, one of these places, so these things will be going down there and hopefully in a sealed box. And I think I showed you the sealed box a few weeks ago. There you go. One sealed box with a lid that goes onto it. Um, and they will be protected. They will be protected from dust and moisture. I mean, there's a silica thing that goes in. will be going in there anyway just to make sure that there's any moisture just gets attracted to the silica. Um, so they were going to storage and hopefully they will be around for many years to come if I ever needed to go back and cut a new image. That then brings you on to the ethical dilemma. So the ethical dilemma I was having was around do I um, allow people to buy me at cost um, the images or you know, in other words do I cut some of these and give you those and I've, I've thought long and hard over this I really have thought long and hard over this and some of you have put comments on the channel as well and the the reality is there is no market for this stuff you know it's only going to be collectors and players like you and I um, that are possibly going to want this stuff on disc and there are a lot of sites on the internet where in effect, you can go and download uh, a lot of this material in SysX format uh, if you so wanted to. I've said I don't like SysX. I prefer to have the disc. I prefer to have a working copy of the disc, and I prefer to have a copy of the disc that works, um, which is much the same thing said three times. So in terms of the ethical dilemma, uh, I 
will be willing to release uh, material from the sound library to those that want it. Uh, there will be a cover charge, um, which I think is going to be around about £4 a disc. Uh, that includes postage. Uh, it might be a little bit more if you're overseas, if I'm honest, because I have to account for overseas postage, which is generally more expensive, and it's going to be a courier rather than uh, UK or European parcel force. Although having said that, I'm sorry guys, but given where we are with Brexit, you're probably going to end up in Europe with the same cost as it's going to cost me to send something to Australia. Um, so I think that's kind of where the cost is. And if you sort of turn around to me and say, well, £4 a disc, that's, that's extortionate. Uh, let me tell you how this how this is kind of broken down. Um, so these things, these actually, would you believe, even though I'm buying these things in bulk, are still working out just under a pound a disc. Um, I can get them slightly cheaper, but the ones I got were slightly cheaper were the ones where, all the, where, where the media broke. Um, so I've tended to sort of go for a slightly more expensive disc because they work. Uh, and even then I've had some failures on the, on the, on the more expensive um, branded, or I say branded, I mean they're really unbranded discs, but I know exactly what they are. Um, so that's that's kind of a pound of, of the cost. Uh, then if you think about labelling and storage and digitalisation and postage on top of that, there is no profit in it. And that was the general idea was that there was it's not a for it's not a profit making um exercise. It is a distribute it's a it's a sharing exercise to make sure that those who want these sounds can get them. That's what this is all about. If they were still being actively sold by the uh, manufacturers, then I wouldn't be doing this because I don't believe that is right. However, the manufacturers, as far as I can tell, gave up the ghost on this stuff 30 odd years ago. They aren't interested. They have no, um, as far as I can see, there's no desire for them to come back into this market space. The world's moved on, they've moved on, and to be honest, they probably haven't got any way of duplicating the material anyway, even if they tried. Um, so we are sort of kind of in that space. So I think that's fair. Um, if you want uh, copies of the T1 stuff that's currently been done, if you PM me, or send a comment in, or email me directly, the email address is on the channel. Um, then we can have a discussion about how much is it going to cost to get it to wherever you are. Uh, and we'll deal with it that way. I'm not going to put this stuff on eBay at the moment. Um, there are a couple of guys flogging, flogging discs on eBay. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, uh, one of them I bought some discs from and those discs have failed miserably. They are rubbish. Um, so he's obviously not doing very good QA on the whole process. He's just banging them out. Um, so that's the open offer. There we are. That's where we are on the disc on the disc library, the sound library as it currently stands. Feel free to contact me. Until next week. See you later. Bye bye. Remember, hit that like button if you like what you saw. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified about more rants more mailbag, more questions and answers, and more videos about this sort of stuff when it's loaded to the channel. Until next time, bye-bye.